Hi everyone and welcome to this uh, Barefoot Science Conference. I'm really happy to be with you today um, to present among a number of really um, top scientists. M my job today is very much to set the scene um, and hand over to some of our other scientists um, who specialize in different areas. Um, and so if we were together now, I would start by asking a question. And, and that question would be, who um, has any relatives from Africa? Okay, and you might think that this is a strange question. Indeed, my students often think it's quite a strange question, except the occasional student who is of African descent, of course, and easily puts their hand up. But what I later go on to tell them is um, whether you've kept in touch with your relatives or not, um, everybody has relatives from Africa. In fact, most of us today only got here about 60,000 years ago when we left Africa. I suppose the next natural question that you might ask somebody is, if you have kept in touch with your relatives, if you have kept in touch with your ancestors, you might ask them, how far back do you go? Now, this is quite a big question because it's almost how long is a piece of string? Do you go all the way back to, for example, when we first stood upright on two legs? That could be four to six million years ago. Do you go back maybe to when we became a uh, more human looking hunter gatherer type um, humans? That could be two million years ago. Or do you just go back as far as modern hunter gatherers? In other words, people that look like me and you, but that were also hunter gatherers. Maybe that's only 200,000 years ago. Whether you've kept in touch with your ancestors or not, what I'm going to show you today is that your ancestors have kept in touch with you. And how would you know whether your ancestors have kept in touch with you or not? Well, there's a few simple experiences from your everyday life that might show you how they have. If you have ever um, witnessed this, so if you have children yourself, if you have nieces or nephews or friends who have children, you will have witnessed this at some point. A child who does not want to wear his or her shoes and refuses to put them on or takes them off as soon as they're put on. Maybe if you haven't seen this, You've experienced this. After that long day at work, what's the first thing that you want to do when you get home? Kick off your shoes. Or you may have also had the reverse experience where you've gone to the beach or you've gone to a grass park, maybe in the summertime, you've removed your shoes and inherently it's felt good. If you've experienced any one of these experiences or all of these experiences, what I'd like to tell you is that your ancestors have kept in touch with you. This is your evolutionary legacy. What feels good, what doesn't feel good, goes back millions and millions of years. So what am I gonna to talk to you about today? Well, I suppose in terms of setting the scene, a good idea would be to say, well, why do we, did we walk in the first place? Why was it that we came down from the trees? How do we do it? What was the advantage in being able to do it? Why and how do we run? Well, the first thing to say is that walking like this is expensive. To be exact, it's about four times uh, as expensive for these guys to walk as it is for us. Now, some of the reasons for this might be quite obvious to you from the pictures. If you look um, at the left or the right hand side of the slide, what you will see is that they lurch forwards, okay? And this requires a huge amount of muscle work and a huge amount of energy just to hold them upwards as they move forward. Or if you look at our friend in the middle, you can see that they lurch side to side. This maybe doesn't require quite as much energy, but you're not going to make progress moving forward um, at any appreciable rate. Well, our designers decided that they need to make a few changes in order to make this uh, ability to move on two legs advantageous, to be able to cover long distances at a lower energy cost, for example. You can imagine this might have been useful when seasons changed or landscapes changed 
and we needed to move other places in order to survive and to reproduce. So what were the main changes? Well, you saw from the image of our friends before that they were stooped forward and their whole body weight therefore was stooping forward. This required an enormous amount of muscle work. So by putting a curve in our spine, this allowed us to bring some of our body weight back over our limbs. Okay, so instead of having to hold up as much of that body weight, we could now bring it back over the limbs that support us. A major evolutionary change that was very, very important to walking and to running, as we'll see in a minute, was transitioning from a backward facing pelvis, which is why you see our ape like ancestors um, lurching forward, to a sideways facing pelvis. So, this sideways facing pelvis was one of the key transitions to upright walking. A sideways pe facing pelvis allows you to essentially lift your body weight up on one leg and allow the other leg to swing through, almost like you're pole vaulting, pole vaulting yourself over your own leg. This reduces the energy cost because you just have to lift with one leg and allow the other leg to swing through. Of course, we needed some changes to go along with our feet as well in order for this to actually work. So we developed arches, arches that could be both stiff and flexible depending on the ground that was underneath. This was um, what allowed us to leverage ourselves, particularly as you can see here at the big toe, upwards and forwards, but maintain stiffness in order to be able to support our body weight. Some of these changes that I've just spoken to you about were, were also key to our ability to run. There were a couple of other changes, however, that also helped us to become very good runners. So um, let's have a look at one or two of those. Well, your Achilles tendon is about 10 times the length of a primate. Your Achilles tendon can store and release energy, much in the way that you might see an elastic band do similar. This, of course, reduces the amount of muscle work and energy that it costs to move. We've already seen our sideways facing pelvis in, in, in walking. Well, guess what? It was essential to running. Running is essentially a series of single leg hops and your bum muscles, your glute muscles on your sideways facing pelvis, they hold you up and stop you from falling over. If you think about it, they are the only link between your um, body weight at your torso and your lower limbs. They're a key muscle and they stopped us from falling over. You can imagine that back, depending on how far back we go with our ancestors, um, falling over might have meant uh, we were going to get eaten for dinner. So it was very important that we did not. Another change was this big ligament that we all have that runs down the back of our head. And you can see this ligament in action today. If you watch somebody run who has a ponytail, what you'll see is that the ponytail rotates in a circle. And that's because this ligament down the back of our neck is restraining the movement of the head. This allows us to keep a steady gaze as we run forward, hopping and springing from one leg to the other. Quite an advantage if you were to be hunting, for example. Now, we also developed big brains. Our big brains allowed us to um, intensively cooperate and to become the species that we are today. This is one of the reasons that we have such a strong need for social connection. This brain also allowed us to overcome problems associated with our environment and settle in many more places. One of the challenges we faced as humans was that sometimes the surface of the ground might have got a little bit rough or a little bit cold or a little bit hot. What we see indirectly is evidence from about 30,000 years ago for the emergence of some form of foot covering. Direct evidence is that comes in at about 10,000 years ago. What you can see with all of this type of footwear is really it respects the foot in that it's quite wide, it's quite thin, it's quite flexible. In other words, it's designed to protect our skin, but not really any more to do any more than that. OK, so it was all going really well for us um, at this point until um, we decided to intervene. 
And we're going to look in the next half of the, of the presentation at what that intervention has meant for us. So how does a foot work as nature intended? I'm going to show you three really easy slides that explain that. What happens to a foot when we put a shoe on it? You'll hopefully be able to make sense of that quite easily from understanding the three easy slides that I've shown you. And what the science tells us about movement with and without shoes. I'll be handing over to my colleagues who are going to take you through that. So the first line of defense is our skin. And you can actually see how our skin works in our favor yourself. If you can actually take your hand right now and look at the palm of it. If you look at the fatty area underneath your thumb, what I want you to do is with your opposite finger, press in on your skin. As you press in on your skin, you will probably notice that it deforms underneath. But not just underneath your finger, it also deforms all around your finger. In other words, when we experience deformation at one part of our skin, it transmits to other parts of our body. Now, what's even more cool is when you release your finger, you'll notice that your skin and tissues underneath repel and come back to their natural state. This is sometimes called biotensegrity. Biotensegrity is a property that's part of all human tissue. If we were to remove your heart from your chest cavity right now and press on it, it would deform and it would repel exactly the way that you've just demonstrated with your own um, skin on your hand. This is important because when we think about skin, connective tissue, tendons, ligaments, all these types of tissue, this idea that when we come in contact with the ground, we deform and repel depending on how the ground is underneath our foot. That is step one of three. Here is step two, under the skin, neatly borrowed from the title of Russell Brand's podcast. So when you come under the skin, what you'll see is um, we have nerve receptors, okay? So those nerve receptors are the same class of nerve receptors that you have in your hand that allow you to perform complex tasks. And what Leah Bentz Group from Canada has shown us is that the nerve receptors tend to be a little bit more dense around the outside of the foot and towards the digits, perhaps where we need them most to be able to sense the ground beneath us. Now, these nerve receptors, well, why do we have them? They help us with pressure, vibration, touch, and stretch. So if you think back to your first physiology slide I just showed you about your skin, wherever we get experience a deformation at the skin is going to alter the position of the sensory receptors underneath the skin. Okay, so how those receptors are stimulated are going to be influenced by how our skin has deformed and changed when we initially come in contact with the ground. These receptors can feed information really quickly to your spinal cord now. That's why it doesn't take you long when you step on a sharp object, object to rapidly remove your foot from that position. In walking and running terms, this means that your foot and your lower limb is constantly making subtle adjustments as you walk along the ground when you are barefoot. This all happens almost beneath your conscious um, knowledge. Well, we've looked at the skin. We've looked at our nerve receptors that can sense that information from the ground, make rapid changes at our spinal cord. The next logical step would be to introduce muscle. Now, you might wonder why I have a picture of the vertebrae of the neck in a presentation about feet. Well, if you look at the muscles in the neck here underneath that are close to the vertebrae, you'll see they're small muscles and they go between each vertebrae. That's because these small muscles that we sometimes call local muscles are very important for stability and stiffness of our joints. What that means is that when big neck muscles that we have, for example, move our head side to side or up and down, these little ones underneath, well, they protect our spinal column and they allow it to act like a flexible rod. If you imagine that we didn't have any of these little small muscles in our neck, and our big muscles came along to move our head, we might experience a lot of sheer and compressive forces at our um, spine. So our little muscles are important for that stability. Unsurprisingly, it's a similar concept at the foot. 
you've got 26 bones and 33 joints and numerous small muscles that are designed to provide stability at the arch and support movement. Outside of your small muscles, we then have the bigger muscles that move us forward. So we have big muscles that are primarily looking ahead and trying to move us forward and smaller muscles underneath that support that movement that provide that stability. Now, at this point, you've completed your three slides of physiology as to how movement works before we interfere with shoes. Let's put all of that together so that it makes sense for you now. So here's our three lines, our three slides, our skin, our nerves and our muscles. There is one important part that you might have noticed I left out, and that is um, what we'll come to in a second in relation to your brain. The combination of our brain, our skin, our nerves and our muscles means humans can do amazing feats like you see in the image here. Really, we can do things just like the animals. That's because we are animals with big brains, essentially, even if you don't like that description. With our brain, it starts to look ahead. So it's looking at the ground and it's starting to weigh up. Where's the best place to put my foot? Where's the best place to position this person to achieve the task that they're trying to do? In this case, maybe get to the top of the mountain. This is called feed forward. In other words, we anticipate we use the big muscles closer to our hips and our thighs to lift our leg and decide where best to place it. Then we introduce the skin, slide one. That deforms as the foot comes in contact with the ground. And then we're back to our reflex sensation where as we come down on this gravelly surface, we're adjusting slightly. So it's this combination of looking ahead with our eyes that our brain can see where it's going, receiving information from our skin and our nerves, making small adjustments with our reflexes that eventually lead to this coordinated human movement that you see here. And really, when you think about how much goes into all of this, it's quite a miracle the things that humans can do with their body in such a complex um, set of mechanisms. Feed for feeding forward and feeding back and storing the memories of what's gone before to try and subtly adjust you to just the right position every time. Now, as I said, it was all going very well until we started to remove some of that feedback. Let's look at what happens then. So what happens to a foot when we put a shoe on it? You guys will be able to nearly shout out the answers at this point because you know how a foot works without having a shoe on it. So let's kind of go at it in, in reverse. Well, I would love to say that I'm the first scientist that discovered what happened when we put a shoe on it. But just like when I was doing my PhD some years ago and I was about to submit my thesis, I found a whole load of research from a couple of hundred years ago that was basically stating what I was about to submit in my PhD thesis. So this image is from a study that was uh, conducted over a hundred years ago. Now, you don't need to be a sports scientist to guess that this looks like a pretty healthy foot. We can see that we've got a nice transverse arch. Um, if we had a side image, we would probably also have a nice longitudinal, medial longitudinal arch. We have an adducted big toe. We have a nice uh, wide foot that looks like it is ready to accept load on it over a broad surface area. So when we um, put a shoe on, again, you don't need to be a sports scientist to see that our foot begins to change. The shape of our foot begins to change. Now, this research was done, as I said, over 100 years ago, um, but lots more of it has been done since and continues to be done right up to the present day. If I was to be really cynical, I would say that my colleagues and I, really all we've done is get a little bit better at measuring it. Instead of photographs now, we have uh, precise pieces of equipment that can show us how the shape and size of our foot changes, but also how that changes the way we interact with the ground. So, I always like to ask, I certainly always like to ask my students to think about why. Why does putting a shoe on make any difference to how we move? Well, let's look at the skin. 
This um, is from uh, Leo Bent's group in Canada. And all it shows you is that when your foot is in neutral, when your foot is pointing up towards your head, or when your foot is pointing down towards the ground, that the thickness of your skin changes. So these are ultrasound images of the skin as you move your foot into different positions. Okay, and you've already demonstrated this yourself when you pressed on your own skin. If you change the position of your hand, if you change the position of your foot, you change the thickness of your skin. And as we talked about, that has consequences for uh, how your nerves are going to interact with the ground. So everything is working quite well at this point. We have a nice broad distribution of forces over the foot. We have lots of feedback to the skin and to the nerves until we intervene. So imagine now with your experiment that you did with me today on your own hand, imagine I put a flip-flop on that hand and you might have to ask yourself, would the skin deform and repel in the same way if I tried to press through the flip-flop? The answer would be probably not. Um, what you would then also have to say is, would that uh, alter the skin around the area that I deformed with my finger? You would have to say probably not. Does that have an influence then on how the nerve receptors are stimulated and the quality of information that would get to my brain? Well, you would have to say definitely. So now what you see what we've done is by changing the skin deformation, by changing the sensory input and the natural reflex arcs, we then start to develop a more blunt movement pattern. So with your hand, it would be a bit like trying to use a keyboard while wearing the flip-flop. Your movement is a bit more blunt. With your foot, your movement is also a bit more blunt. Now, it's not quite the same because of course our feet are designed for weight bearing in a way that our hands are not, but this is a useful analogy to help you understand the concept. Now, muscles, of course, they work to the principle of use it or lose it. So if you don't use your muscles as much, then they start to get smaller and weaker. Remember those little nut muscles I showed you in the neck and in the foot? Well, if they're held in a cushioned shoe where they're not stimulated in the way that runner was going up the quarry, well then there's no reason for them to work as much. This leads us to having a collapsed arch. Now, the change in feedback in, in, from the ground also means that we can run in a different way. So we might be more inclined to use blunt running mechanics. And what that means is sort of plodding on the ground or um, pounding the pavement rather than running elegantly like those runners I showed you earlier on. So now what we have is a situation where we're using blunt running mechanics down on top of a foot that's not as strong um, as it once was and is not using its connective tissue mechanisms and springs in the same way that it was when it was barefoot. Okay, of course, a foot doesn't just function on its own. It functions in relation to the ground. And again, sometimes a game I play with my students is to get them to use their own mind to see how maybe they are moving quite different to how their ancestors did and what the consequences of that might be. So what I try and get them to do is not to tell me what's in the pictures, but to just tell me the differences between the surfaces. With some prodding, eventually I get answers like soft, hard, uh, variable, consistent, wet, dry. Okay, and this helps us to see the difference in how our foot is going to interact with the surface. Of course, we've got the foot itself, 26 bones, 33 joints. So just like our image of the grass above, it is an irregular shaped structure. It is designed to deform, but also to be stiff and to be used in a variety of different ways, depending on the ground it encounters. Whereas the regular interior of a shoe is quite consistent like the pavement. And so what we can see here is on the left hand side, we are using, uh, we are a sort of a, an, an organism that's capable of variability running on top of a surface that's also varying versus we are in shoes that are regular on a surface that is regular. And it's these combination of factors, not just the barefoot or the surface that lead to us having different running mechanics in both situations. Okay, 
So what, what might we imagine is happening to produce a runner who's running in shoes on the pavement? Well, we're essentially cutting off the bottom half. We can still use our eyes, of course, to see in front of us and to see where we're going to move, but we have significantly re reduced the impact of our connective tissue structures and our nervous system. What that means is we are going to probably plod or pound on, on the surface rather than run gracefully like we saw earlier. Now, what I want you to do is at this point is give you a little bit of the so what before I hand over to my colleagues to take over. I've hopefully given you some understanding as to how a shoe functions or how a foot functions without shoes and on a variety of surfaces and a, a comparison of how it might function in shoes and on limited surfaces. But all of this is sort of so what unless there's actually an outcome for us on our day to day living. Well, the top five running injuries seem to have some things in common with the patterns on the right hand side of the screen. In other words, the regular surface, the regular footwear. And uh, our job as scientists is to try and understand this better. And hopefully, um, if we were wearing a clinician hat, to improve the situation for runners and try and reduce the injuries that they might experience. The scientists are going to talk to you next, are going to talk to you about research for how this type of behavior over time may lead to different movement skills, different uh, injury risk um, and what the outcomes might be for our health and development. I hope from what I've done with you here that I've given you an overview and set the scene for you to enjoy that science that's going to come next. Okay, so the last thing I'm going to leave you with today is just a little bit about the research that we're doing right now at the Institute of Technology in Carlo. Our first main group of interest are children. We are really interested in how children grow up with and without footwear. After that, we're interested in how their musculoskeletal systems are different in children who grow up with and without footwear. And of course, the holy grail in all of this work is to see, does that have any implications for their musculoskeletal health or injury risk? Some of this uh, work came from my own experiences in New Zealand, where you can see in the bottom image, children often don't mind uh, participating in athletics even on a hard surface. It is also designed to tackle the global burden of disease that's occurring from children becoming less and less active, but not only less active, less active in a variety of ways. Even the exercise we do now has become a little bit uh, routine, has become a little bit too linear. We are no longer perhaps climbing walls, climbing trees, and moving in a variety of ways the way our ancestors would have. There are some brilliant colleagues who are helping me with this research at Carlo. We have Sharon Kinsella, who is looking at how to understand the impact of footwear on children and parents of children with autism. We have Damien, who is responsible for the Step Start Exercise Program, a variable exercise program that challenges kids in a variety of ways without the competitive element that might promote dropout from sport. We have our PhD student, Maisie, who is looking at differences in musculoskeletal structure and function and movement skills in children and adolescents with and without shoes. This project is also supported by Kelly down in New Zealand, who is our collaborator on that. Now, we do have interest in adults as well. We do want to give hope to runners who've maybe been struggling with injuries of this nature. We do want to make life better for our military personnel as well. We have a lot of people who are doing some very exciting work in this area. We have Kieran, who's looking at the impact of surfaces on how we barefoot run. We have Stephen, who's looking at how barefoot uh, running impacts plantar fasciitis in runners. We have Hannah, who is looking at how uh, minimalist footwear impacts pain and biomechanics in knee osteoarthritis. We have people like myself, Ian, Cassie, who are looking at how runners um, get injured and uh, how the footwear impacts on that injury risk. That's just a little bit of the work that we're doing with Carlo. I really hope you enjoy the science that's coming next from my scientific colleagues from uh, different universities around the world. And I hope I've set the scene for you to understand a little bit more about uh, your ancestors.